When you're getting started with slow stitching, you're bound to have some questions. Today, I'm gonna answer the top three questions I get asked all the time. I'll be covering detailed information about the supplies I use and how I use each one. And for the final question, which is also the most frequently asked, I get really personal about what slow stitching means to me. So join me for my top three answers to questions. I'm glad you're here. Let's get started. The very first most common question I'm asked is about needles, threads, and other supplies for slow stitching. I use the six stranded embroidery floss and they come in skeins like this and you can take them out and wind them around these bobbins. And you can get trays to keep these bobbins in. If you're starting or expanding your collection of floss and you're looking for some suggestions about which colors to choose, I have a free PDF download with my essential 30 colors for slow stitching. It's a place to get you started so that you have a rainbow of colors to do any kind of stitching. You can access that file by going to my website and at the bottom of any page, sign up for my newsletter. Then you'll be sent a link to the PDF file. And if you're not interested in receiving the newsletter, that's okay. You can unsubscribe at any time. And for this floss, I use two different types of needles. I use embroidery needles and milliner's needles. Here's another brand. And this set comes in sizes three to nine. These are the embroidery needles, also in sizes three to nine. The main difference between these two types of needles is that the embroidery needle has a larger eye, so it's easier to thread. And for the milliner's needles, the eye is smaller, so the shaft of the needle is the same size from the top to the bottom. And this makes it easier to pull the needle through, particularly if you're doing French knots. So I use both kinds of these needles I generally use two strands of floss, and I find that the needles in these sets, the numbers three to nine, work really well for that. I also use pearl cotton, size eight. Also comes in lots of colors, like the stranded embroidery floss. This one's by DMC, this one's by Wonderfill. I like them both. So the pearl cotton size eight works really well with tapestry needles, size 24. So this one's by DMC. Another name for the tapestry needle is a chenille needle. So this is a chenille size 24, this is a tapestry size 24, and they're the same. You can also use Milner's needles, size one. These are Milner's big eye, and so they work quite well. They're a little bit longer than the tapestry or chenille needles. So any of these will work well with the Pro Cotton size eight. I also like to use needle threaders. This is a nice one by Colonial. It has two ends on it. So the one end is for threading a larger or thicker thread, and the other end is for a thinner thread. So you just pull it out. This is the larger end, and you can use that to thread your needle. I also like to use these really inexpensive kind, and they usually come in a pack where there's several. So I find that it's really easy to always find one. And to use these, you take the eye of your needle and you thread it on and you put your thread through here. I'm just going to use one strand to demonstrate. So you put your thread through the eye of here and you slide the needle off and then it's threaded. I also like to use thimbles. I have a few types that I like to use. This one is by Clover and it has a hard end, so it's really good for pushing the needle through when you've got some thicknesses. Protects your finger. There's also these gripping thimbles, and they usually come in a set with different sizes so you can fit them on your different fingers. So if you're looking for these, these are often called silicone finger protectors. Sometimes they're marketed to guitar players, so that's where you'll find those. I find they're quite helpful. This one is called a soft comfort thimble. So this darker green part is silicone and this whole end piece is hard. So you can put that on your finger. You can use it in a similar way to this one that has the silicone 
and the hard end. This one's more rounded. So it's really about preference, what feels comfortable on your finger. I also recommend having a nice plate to keep all these things on. It helps keep them organized and it's something that I enjoy looking at. So on my little plate, I have some kind of thread conditioner. This is a needle puller that I can use to pull a needle through if it's really stuck. I have thimbles, needle threaders, and some wonder clips, along with whatever threads I'm currently using in my project. I've recently started using this type of thimble, and really what it is is a sticker. So you peel it off, and you can place it wherever it is that you want to protect. Sometimes I end up putting it on the side of my finger when I'm stitching, because what happens is when I'm holding the needle and I'm sewing, sometimes the back part of the needle continues to rub on my finger and it gets tender. So these thimblets protect your finger if you're doing quite a bit of stitching and you can reuse them too. The adhesive works for quite a while. You can just peel them off and you can save them and use them again. The other thing I recommend having is an iron. This is my Clover Mini Iron. I've had it for about 10 years. I really like how small it is. I can just have it on the table where I work. And it has a couple of heat settings. I even think you can get different heads for it. This is the one that came with it and it works great for my purposes. So having a regular iron or a small iron, just to deal with wrinkles, and if you're using any kind of fusible, it's a really handy thing to have. There are different types of marking pens out there. Ones that are heat erasable and air erasable, I like these friction pens that erase with heat. And there's also a hair marker. What a hair marker is, it's a way to mark on fabric. So with a hair marker, you can mark lines for stitching without any kind of permanent mark. These can be really handy when you're not sure how your fabric's going to react to any kind of pen. I also recommend having some kind of pin cushion to keep your needles and a pair of embroidery scissors are very handy to have. There are also different types of thread conditioners that you can use to run your thread across before you start sewing. So to do that, you can pull your thread through and then you run your hands down the length of the thread to distribute that wax. And there are several different types out there. But the principle is the same with all of them, where you pull your thread through and it gives your thread a gentle coating of wax and that's to keep it from tangling. The other thing that a lot of people swear by is to not use any product at all. Just use your fingers and run it down the thread several times. And again, that's to keep it from knotting while you stitch. There are many different ways to knot the end of your thread. The one that I've always used is to take the end of the thread, the point of the needle, point them together. I pinch the end of the thread with this hand. I wind it with this hand and then I pull downwards, holding on to that wrapped bundle and pulling it all the way to the end of the thread. And that creates a knot. The second most commonly asked question is about the base I use for slow stitching. I like to use felt. I buy felt from my local quilt shop and it comes on the bolt. It's very soft, feels good in my hand, and it's really beautiful to stitch through. Here's a piece of felt from a craft store. This is made from recycled plastic bottles. This felt is good too. It's thinner. If I hold it up to the light, you can actually see through it. So what I found with the heavy stitching that I do is sometimes this felt will start to fall apart and disintegrate under the heavy stitching. So I tend to use this kind of felt as a backing sometimes, but I don't generally use this as a base for stitching. The felt that I get from a fabric shop is denser, but it's still soft and easy to stitch through. It's a little bit thicker than the craft felt and it holds up to the heavy stitching. So I buy it in black and white and it comes on the bolt and it's really affordable. You can also use wool felt or fabric. This is a piece of linen 
you can see the weave, it's not too tightly woven, and this is really nice to stitch through. This is a cotton. I've tea dyed this, so it has nice variation in color. Both of these would be very nice to stitch on. In a previous video, I stitched this piece. The fabric I started with was this. Now I did put felt behind it, but I could have used this as a base on its own. This was a cotton bed sheet that I dyed. You can see the hem here on this end piece. The main thing that I'm looking for for a base is something that's easy to stitch through. So a really tightly woven fabric would not be one that I would choose. Here's an example where I didn't use any felt. This is a piece of quilting cotton and it's folded onto itself. And I've just stitched on here. There's no collage or anything else. Now this quilting cotton is a little bit thick when it's doubled over. Very nice to stitch through, but not quite as soft and easy and enjoyable as stitching on felt like this. So I think it's a good idea to experiment and see what feels comfortable in your hand. But you don't have to use felt. You can also, of course, use quilt batting if you have that on hand. Anything that feels nice in your hand to stitch through. By far, the most common question I'm asked is what do I do with my completed stitching? This can be a really hard question to answer because I want to encourage people to stitch for the sake of stitching. There's so many benefits to the simple act of stitching thread into fabric. I strongly believe that slowly and thoughtfully stitching can create a connection to ourselves, to the aliveness of the world around us, and even to each other. And I'm hoping that stitching will invite a shift in perspective, a feeling of calm, a sense of peace, and that's why I share all my slow stitching secrets, because I want the same thing for you that I have found in the joy of slow stitching. So having said all that, I'm going to give you some ideas. Here is a stitched piece. This is from a video where I talked about my top three stitches for slow stitching. And when I was finished this piece, I attached it to canvas. So your stitched piece can most definitely be a work of art. I suggest starting small. Here's a brooch. I've used a piece of craft felt on the back to cover my stitches and I've added a pin. And I'll link to the video where I make this. You can also make a needle case. I'm gonna to link to all the videos where I make these pieces. So here's the front and the back. So I have a pocket inside here and a place to keep my needles. This is a really nice beginner project. You can also make a pouch. This is a pouch that I made that I recycled and I'll link to that video. This one, I added Velcro as a closure. And it's a great pouch to hold a few stitching things in. I've also made many drawstring pouches. I have a separate video on this rounded pouch and that comes with a free template. You can also make a square pouch this is one of the first ones I made. I've made so many of these. These are very addictive to make. They're great for gifts. You can make them bigger or smaller. Really versatile project. I've also made a bigger pouch. Now, this one has no closure, but because of the felt inside, it sits on its own. It's really great for storing, stitching things in. This was so enjoyable to make. So if you're looking for a larger project, it's a bigger piece of felt and fabrics to begin with. It takes a little bit longer. You can also make a scissors case and I have a free template for this. Another really enjoyable project. I've lined this with craft felt. And there's my scroll project, which was so enjoyable. This is a larger project using my mini templates. I also have a video where I made this pin cushion and I use this constantly. Don't rule out mending or embellishing clothing. This is the pocket of an apron and it had three holes in it and I've mended them different ways. I think I'm going to continue and add more stitching. It's a great way to make a piece unique or to revive a piece. This is a beautiful cotton material. This shirt belonged to my mother. She's been gone a few years now and I've 
hung on to this piece. It has some stains on it. And of course on white, stains tend to show up quite a bit more. So I think I'm gonna dye it and I'm going to add stitching all over it. I'm going to make it into something beautiful, which I think my mom would really appreciate. So this is going to be something that's meaningful and enjoyable. I did a series of videos creating these patches for the back of my jean jacket. I made this bunny patch and this deer patch and this fox patch, and then I attached them to the jean jacket and added some more pieces of fabric to fill in the gaps. If that's something that interests you, please check out that series where I complete this. And now I have a unique jean jacket, unlike any other. So as you can see, there are a lot of things that you can do with your slow stitching, but please remember, you don't have to. You can stitch a piece and save it, and maybe you'll find a use for it later, or maybe you never will, and that's okay. In the description, there's a wealth of information, all types of links to all the projects that I've mentioned. If you have any questions, leave a comment below. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this answers some top questions and inspires you to get going with slow stitching. Until next time, happy stitching.